What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. Today, I have a very old friend and incredibly influential guy on the pod. I've known this dude since 1993, 93 till infinity. That song probably means something to you, Jamal. Um, <laughs> Jamal is the co-founder and executive chef of two incredible restaurants in New York. One is called Crown Shy. And then in the same building on the 63rd floor uh, is his incredibly like super, super unique, very, very insanely dope fine dining restaurant called Saga. Uh, Jamal has been cooking for over 20 years. Professionally, he started in 2001 with Jean George. He went to work with Daniel Hum for 10 years. He got uh, best restaurant in the country um, while he was there. The guy is an animal. We went to high school together. I remember in high school, him talking to me about molecular gastronomy. Uh, we were both working um, sort of like in the industry. I was, I was probably one of the only kids that had a job all through high school. Every, like I was, I mean, that's legit true, no? Yo, uh, Michael Chernow, my man, I just, <laughs> it's an honor to, yo, it's an honor to, to be on this podcast with you, bro. Like, um, the, you know, the evolution of my man right here is, is incredible. You know, from us being little kids, little shitheads in LaGuardia, which was a really great school. It was an artistic school, like, you know, like, you know, special people went to that, that place and, 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 you know, it was like a really creative outlet. Um, you know, and, uh, to see my man at this point, basically the most fit person and the most handsome person that I know by far. <laughs> and uh, I'll take you know, it. To, yeah, I love that, man. And just the evolution is, is, is incredible. So I'm honored to be on this with you um, to chop it up and kind of talk through, um, you know, this whole process. Jamal, we have we have a long history, man. I mean, we we've known each other a really long time and I appreciate that the the, uh, the kindness. But I, I, I'm I'm honored to have you on here, dude. You are a guy um, that has literally been in the kitchen working with and for some of the best culinarians in the world um, for for two decades. Um, to be fair, and I'm sure you could probably say the same thing about me. I did not think that that was going to be the case for you when we were in high school. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, you know, to be honest, like I'm surprised that 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 like we made it this far. To be honest, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, it was a job. Like what you said, like you had a job during during high school. For me, like we were broke, we didn't have money. Literally, when I was in junior high school, my mom would give wouldn't give me any money to go to school, and we go to out lunch. So we'd go to McDonald's and everyone would be eating and just abusing me because I'm, I'm standing there trying to get a fry from all, all these jerk kids. And, um, you know, we just like my mom struggled. And uh, my uncle's best friend owned a restaurant in Hell's Kitchen. And he grabbed me by the shirt and brought me there. And he's like, you have a job. So I was a busboy and I would make 80 bucks a day. And it was enough to like, initially it was like to buy candy, food, go to the movies, and then later it was like to buy blunts and forties and fillies and all the other dumb shit that we used to do. But it was, you know, it was a job and, you know, it put money in my pocket, you know, and it started there. And then I would sneak into the kitchen cause I was a little chubby kid also. And I love food. So I would sneak in and like, you know, start cooking for myself and get there before the chef. So I could get the good stuff. I would take the lobster and the expensive stuff that they would never let us eat. Um, and then uh, I kind of fell into it. You know, like 
It's not something that I really intended. You know, I went to school for singing. I went to LaGuardia. I was a vocal major. Um, and I was in the theater and I was, you know, you're a kid. You're trying to find your way. Like you've no idea, zero idea. And I had very little guy, uh, little guidance at home. My mom was really young when she had us. She had her demons. My dad wasn't really around. My older brother was a knucklehead and like, you know, and uh, no guidance. And I just got to was- share a little story about your brother. The first time I met your brother, I was, uh, I mean, look, we were, we were into growing up in New York City uh, in family situations where there wasn't a lot of money around. Like, you know, you have access to a lot of shit in New York, right? So you get yourself involved in, if you're a hustler, like, and an entrepreneur, even at an early age, because I was, like, you just, you get yourself involved in, in, in shit. And I remember so clearly the first time I met your brother, Um, I was, I moved out of my parents' house. I was 15. I was living in a dorm in NYU with this chick. And we, we, we ordered weed um, and your brother showed up (laughs) in a head to toe, full North face suit parka suit <laughs> like a like yeah, a you um, know like the you know like the the everest of course that was the, his uniform bro that was that was the that bright was the red and um and he had like he literally rolled in like with this with the schooner like like hood up yeah and i was like i gotta i gotta get closer to this guy somehow um this, this <laughs> dude this dude is in, is 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 doing something that i want um and 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 ultimately i ended up getting closer to your brother but um you know, the, the, the premise of Border Made is to get people on the podcast like you that have impacted uh, lots of people. And you have impacted lots and lots of people. I know so many people that have worked for you uh, under so, your- uh, Eric, your cousin. Eric, my cousin. So my cousin, yeah. uh, who's also an incredible chef, um, worked for you for years. Yeah, came to 11 Madison Park. And, and like, I remember you were like, you know, you vouched for him, but you're like, I don't know if he's good or not. He's like, he's a good kid. <laughs> and, and he came in and, and it's just when I took over Love Madison Park and, and I was making the calls and he was literally one of my first hires. And, you know, like for me, I hire people not based off of their skill set because I can teach you skills. You know, like I hire people based on who they are. And, and it's what I've done over the past 20 years or the past 42 years of, of my life is getting good reads of people. And, and, and that's what kind of leads me to really great cooks and, and employees and great partners. It's not the skill. And this is a Danny Meyer thing, like 51, one percenter. Like I, I want to hire the person, not the skill. Mm-hmm. And Eric was one of the guys that he was just super eager and hungry and young. And, and he came in and did really well. And he's, he's a little quirky dude. He's, you know, uh, you know, but he did really well. And now he's killing it. You know, he, he's, he's his own chef. He's running a restaurant. Yeah. He's doing really well. I actually you know, had dinner over at uh, at his restaurant last week, um, and I, I was, pronounce it sadly. Yeah, I told him I was like, "Dude, you got to <laughs> change the fucking name of that place, man." For years, I've actually said, like, I mean, yo, know, the first step, I love you. You got to change the name, and he knows that. Um, but he, they've now cut it down to just La Compagnie. Um, La Compagnie, yeah, yeah. That's, that makes sense. I could do yeah. that. Um, so, so, you know, the idea is I get people like you on the show who have inspired me, inspired others, and we get to talk about the nature nurture question, whether you think you were born with an inherent or innate ability to get to where you're at today, or if you think you were made over time. Um, the way I like to get there is to go all the way back to like childhood, young childhood and understand what drove you as a kid. Um, and I'm sure that we're going to have a fun time talking about that. Um, but what drove you? I love the kid? premise, man. I love the premise, dude. It's so it's it's super smart. You know, I just think I I I think that there and 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 I've I've come clean about this, right? Like I do believe that there is uh, a gene that people that are ambitious have um, that that potentially is 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 you know, inherited through the, through the, the bloodline um, that drives us, that makes us obsess over certain things that are, I know for me, you know, it, like the shit that I'm interested in, I don't do, I fucking murder. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't, it's yeah. not like I just, 
I don't like look at it and say, oh, this is something I'm going to do. It's like, mm -hmm. and there, and I don't do a lot. I don't like, you know, my life is, I, I've got like a few buckets, but the things that I actually like execute, I go all the way, all the mm -hmm. way on. And, uh, and you do too. Um, and so I want to go all the way back, man. I want to hear what drove you and I want to, I want to hear your story. So let's get there. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. So as, as a young kid, so I'm from New York city, born and raised, I grew up in Greenwich village. Um, my younger years, we lived in hell's kitchen. Um, and you know, my father, my mom was 19 when she had my brother Rashid. Um, and my dad was like 21, 22. And I'm like, dude, imagine us having kids when we're 19, you know, it's just like, I, I couldn't imagine now as a grown up having two kids, like being a parent at 19 is just fucking something that, that, that I struggle with. And like, mm. you know, so we lived in Hell's Kitchen, um, which was really crazy. There were dope heads on the street. It was dangerous. You know, it was like not the best like neighborhood in, in the city. Um, and my dad wasn't really present. My, you know, we, we, we had, didn't have the most stable home. Um, but we were happy and my brother was with me, you know, we, we had, we had this core group. Um, and I think, you know, something that, that I, that I understood at a, as a, at a young age that everything felt like it was out of reach, like all the things out there, like a car or, you know, like, like I realized that we didn't have things that other people had. Um, and, you know, my grandma was the matriarch. She, thank God, had, had some means and, 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 and supported us. Um, you know, so we moved from Hell's Kitchen when I was five. We moved into this beautiful place in Greenwich Village. You've been there. You know, it's like, and we had this beautiful home. It was amazing. And I was always really proud of it. You know, but beyond that, you know, it, it was a really challenging existence for us. Um, you know, from the outside, it looked like we were in a good spot, but we had food stamps and my mom would like send me to D'Agostino's in Greenwich Village with food stamps. And I was like a little kid, I was like six, seven years old, like going to the store, you know, so things felt out of reach. And I think for both my brother and I, we understood that we needed to hustle. And my brother more than I, he was older, took more risks, you know, rolled with, with like the tougher crew, you know, but at an early age, we needed to hustle, you know, so we, there were art fairs on the block. We lived on 10th street and we'd go down and sell baseball cards and we'd sell cookies and we'd sell lemonade. And just the idea of counting money, we would iron it and press it and like put it up to the light and just had these crisp dollar bills. And it was something that like, you know, at, we were seven, eight, nine years old. We understood the value of money and the lack of it that we had. Um, so it's like that hustle, that grinding, like how do we, you know, how do we, we get the things that we want? Do you, can I ask you a question? Um, it's so funny because I didn't know that. And I, I had very similar situation. I was selling everything I could sell yeah. uh, at that age. But do you remember, like, do you remember the, the feeling that you had? Was there something or was it your brother? Like, do you remember what it was going through your mind when you were like, we're going to go down and sell baseball cards and, and lemonade? I, you know, like, to be honest, I feel like it may have been my mom trying to get rid of us because, <laughs> yo, she, you know, my mom was an alcoholic and she's been, and I don't know, if, you know, I, I know that there's rules about talking about these things, but she's open, has been sober for 30 years and, you know, kind of has evolved and has really, you know, kind of changed her life. But when we were young, I feel like it was like she wanted to sleep till three o'clock and like put us on the street to, you know, like, but, but it, then it turned into, you know, this hustle, you know? And, and, you know, I was younger, my brother was, was older and, and turned it, you know, he, he has the real hustle gene or had it, you know, he was the early hustler. You know, I, I was the one that was like kind of learning and, um, you know, like I, I don't have that initial feeling. I don't really, you know, it's not, but to be honest, I think my mom just got rid of us. She's like, yeah, what would be fun is, is going downstairs. And then, then it was a game for us. Then we're like, oh, let's, let's add, uh, add some skews. <laughs> we went and got cookies like oh we want some more cookies get lemonade we want pink lemonade yellow lemonade so you know it's, it's just about like you know adding value diversifying mm -hmm. all things that we that we learned at a very young age and for me man i'm like and it's something that i'm that i that i'm, I'm 
struggling with because over the past 40 years of my life, I've put in a lot of work and I'm at a place that I, my kids are in a better place than I was when they were, when I was their age, you know, and, and I imagine you're, you're in, in the same place. Like how do we support our kids, give them everything that we didn't have and not, not spoil them to the point where they don't know how to, how to fend for themselves. And the reason why I'm here is because no one gave me shit. Yo, when I went to college, my mom gave me $20. She's like, here's $20. I'm like, what? I was like crying. Literally, I was crying. I took like a basket of like socks, like a plastic thing. I smashed it on, on you know, on, on, the, on the street. And I'm like, okay, I need to fend for myself. So I like got a pound of weed <laughs> and, and my, whole, my whole college life was, was hustling to pay bills, to pay rent, to pay school and to like, to do the things that I wanted to do, you know? And I realized at an early age that you need to, you need to hustle. And my kids have everything they want, but they hear the stories. They hear these stories. I tell them, I don't get into the details, but they understand all the hard work that I put into this, into our lives. And I think a really, a really smart guy, super wealthy, like Goldman Sachs guy, he was like, and he, he came from, 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 from nothing really. His father owned a, um, a furniture store and his father taught him about the business, but not just the highs, it was the lows also. He was like, hey, we got this, this couch that sucks that no one wants to buy, you know, like we're losing money. And he's like, teach your kids the ins and the outs. It's not all about the highs. You have to let them understand that it's a business. So when I'm building the restaurant, they come in and I'm talking to them through costs and they're young, you know, they were six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 when, when we're building this restaurant. But the goal is to introduce them to like the reality of life and not just the shiny things, you know? You know, so it's that- funny. I, um, I, so that's such a great point. I think the, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think one of the things that crosses my mind specifically now, because we've moved out of New York, and my, I'm my my family is basically staying upstate. We're not we're not going to be back. I mean, I'm going to be back in the city a few days a week, but mm-hmm. we're up here. And I always I never thought in a million years that my kids were not going to grow up in New York City. I was just like, you know, there's no way. I mean, New York City made me hands yep. down. It just yep. it made me who I am, the good and the bad. Right. And so I wanted that for my kids not necessarily the bad because I got it. I went through some hell as you know. Um, but you know, like that you, you're, I, I, I haven't really thought through, and it's so good that you bring this up because I think it's a, it's a, it's an important thing to talk about specifically with our age group, people who have kids, um, who are successful. How do you instill value? like we had because every dollar that you and I had as kids, we made, Yeah, we made. my parents didn't give me money, you know? And so, and it, but it's so hard for me as a father who like did not have shit uh, as a kid to like (laughs) walk through the store and see something and not want to scoop it for my kids, you know, and be like, Oh, yo, dude, my son, trust me, like the first day of school, he's got the freshest J's. He's like, he, he's basically how I would, <laughs> my son is like a snapshot from the, the past. He's like, you know, how I would have wanted to dress at, at, as a 10 year old, you know, some rock and polo shirts and just like whatever it is. And, you know, so th- it, it's just, it's this, it's this dance, it's this game, you know? So fun. what is it? So let's just talk about it. Take a little sidetrack because I think this is valuable stuff, right? Like, how do, as, as, as guys who came up hustling and having to make ends meet in our own way, um, understanding the value of cash and knowing that if you wanted something, um, you know, you had to work for it, you know, how to, you know, I mean, I just know when I was 15, 16 years old, I was carrying fucking buckets of ice through nightclubs. Like, yeah. you know, like th- there was never a moment where it wasn't risking our life, you know, risks. You know, like literally like one misstep, you know, I would drive with like 10 pounds of, you know, whatever it's like, and, and one misstep and I would not be here. Yeah. We would not be here. Yeah. One, one left turn that should have been a right turn and you've run into the wrong people. You get caught, you know, whatever it is. So like, 
for some reason, someone wants us here, you know, like, and, and, you know, there's a lot of luck involved. You know, I say, it's there's a, there's a crazy story luck. that I tell every once in a while. Um, and I've never actually said it on here uh, on this podcast, but someone we know well, you know, very, very well, um, <laughs> sold an enormous amount of drugs um, and lived across the street from the police station. Yeah, you know, hidden yeah. Sight, only way it, to do it. I, I mean, and I'm not, I'm saying that, like, not just like, I'm not like saying, oh yeah, they were like across, I mean, they were actually across the street from the police station on 20th yeah, street, across. directly yeah. across the street. And I say how, like in my teens, you know, getting away, you know, like, the, like, I mean, I can't even put it into words. The risk. I love it. I love it. I love you trying to formulate your thoughts because it's just like it's so it's so bananas. You know, it's bananas. Yeah. Anyways, all right. So I I think the idea is you know it, the the conversation about having a trying to teach your kids value. You know, I not last summer but the summer before uh, we've got this awesome house upstate and where you know. I said to my son, I said, look, my older son, my younger son is too small. But I said to my older son, I was like, look, here's the deal. It's a it's it's, you know, middle of the summer. People are driving up and down the street. I bet you and I can go out and sell lemonade and make a killing. And he got really excited about it. So I said, here's the deal. Let's drive over to the farm store. I will buy the lemon, the sugar. And, uh, and then we'll go over to Walmart and I'll get a, I'll get a big container for it. And we did that. It cost me $38. So I showed them the money that I spent. I showed them the receipts and I said, you're going to sell this lemonade with me on the front. I'm going to help you make it. I'm not going to charge you for labor. Um, and we're going to sell it and we're going to see how we do. And I've got photos and videos of this. It was insane. My son sold $88 in an hour and a half of oh, lemonade good margins. I, I was expecting terrible margins. That's a good mark. Lemonade is a good business. <laughs> $88 in an hour and a half because he was literally standing on the side of the road screaming lemonade. I mean, he got so into it. And I said, now you're going to have to give me the 38 bucks. And it was a little <laughs> bit of a battle, <laughs> but, but ultimately we did that. Like, almost every weekend. And yeah. he's, he's, he's still, he's got that cash. And so I think doing little things like that, not just like selling lemonade with your kid, but like teaching them yeah. what it means to, to do business. Right. And I know it sounds crazy to try to teach a five-year-old that, but I think dropping seeds like that at that you gotta, age, yeah, you got to start early. Yeah. Like dropping seeds is, is, is such a great metaphor. You know, like, you you know, you got to drop it and it slowly grows. And, you know, I think, I think that's incredible. You know, for me, you know, it's, it's something that, that I, I don't have such a great story or such a tangible way to kind of instill life lessons in, in, in my kids. I'm just really honest with them. Um, and, you know, and always talk them through things and let them know where we came from they understand the struggles they understand that my life wasn't roses you know um and you know but they're like you know they've been to marrakesh you, you know they've like like we spent a month in need you know like we, we like they 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 definitely understand that they are are in, in, a, in are in a great place but it's just about being honest with them and also like we have friends and family that that are, are still in the hustle that are still struggling. And like, they understand that also, you know, so, and, and I'm very lucky, like my wife, Kelly, which we went to high school with, she's amazing. And, and her family, they're some of the greatest people that I've ever, ever known. Um, and, you know, they grew up in Hell's Kitchen and it's a tight knit family and, you know, they're not wealthy, but they are all doing fine. And I've worked really hard and are successful in their own rights, but it's like, you know, wealth doesn't mean anything, you know, like their family meant everything. There was the core group. They would do anything for ed anyone. 
and um, you know, so you know, we have this amazing group, and you know, Kelly is, is very special and very lucky. We've been married 13 years and dated for 20. You know, it's one of these kind of like amazing stats. <laughs> but she's also very good with these kids because she's like has that that Puerto Rican inner hatred that like doesn't play. You know, she's like not. She she has that loving Puerto Rican side of like the nurturing mother and then like like you know the firecracker that just like you know doesn't settle for anything you know so it's it, it's yeah. this it's it's this dance like both of us you know work really well as a team. My and wife honestly, is the boss, straight up, hands down. When it comes to the household, she just she's the boss. I don't you know she I I feel like that Scandinavian the the Scandinavian you know, women are so strong, similar to Latin women, man. Latin women are just like, you know. Yeah. Fire. Yeah. So you're <laughs> saying honesty? I think, you know, like honesty and, you know, like, I don't think we give them everything, but they don't need, you know, like, you know, like we don't spend a lot of money it's crazy how I didn't even realize that when when Gavin was first born, like the cost of kids' toys were were like for twenty dollars you get seventeen toys. It kind of like and I I was upset with my parents even more. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, yo, dude, seventeen dollars got me these twenty GI Joes. That's all it was. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, so it's like, you know, we're we're, we're just we're giving them, you know, we're not like. I don't think that we're spoiling them. You know, I introduce them to great food and restaurants and great places and good people, you know? Um, and, but then also like some life lessons, you know, like this is, this is stuff that I've earned. This is not so something anyone gave me, you know? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I really hope like those seeds that we're dropping are really bear, are like germinating and are going to bear fruit. You know, who knows? I think they are. Um, I think they are. And, and I, and I think that anybody listening, you know, just value here is just make sure I, I think if you have means, obviously, let your kids live, um, you know, and treat them the way you would want to be treated. Um, if you were in their situation, however, the, the important component is to talk to them about the good and the bad right? Yeah. Like, like, give it, give it to give it to them clean, even at a young age, you know, sometimes my mm -hmm. wife tells me to chill, you know, I'm, I'm going too far in terms of like, you know, my kid goes in, you know, I've got a gym in the garage, and my both of my sons, well, I'm in there every single morning, and they when they wake up at six, I'm typically in their training. And so they'll come in. And they'll want to like, hang out and work out with me. And I'm like, like actually trying to give him like, yeah, all right, well, let's go. Let's do some pull-ups. <laughs> and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, they're in the oh, gym with me. Early. No one, yeah, no yeah. one, no one in my life at that age, sorry, ma, sorry, dad, but like gave two shits about teaching me anything, you know, like when it came down to like, take, like taking time out of the, what was going on in their life to teach me something that would be yeah. a benefit to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think even, even the smallest things like that, where they come in, they, they see me in the morning working out is a big deal, you know? Um, all right. End of the day, they like one last thing and we can pivot, but like, you know, you like, you emulate the people that are around you that you respect and you love, you know, like, and I like, just them seeing you, the dedication, they're like, damn, he's up before me in the gym doing this crazy shit. Like that is going to translate when they're older. They're going to, they're going to be like, you know, all these things that they see are going to translate into, into who they are as, as people. I you agree. Know? Um, all right. So let's get back to, to the, to you, man. Um, so you're coming up and now you're, you're, you're a teenager. What's that feel like? Yeah. So, you know, we, we went to high school together and Michael Chernow was once Mikey Chernow. Yep. <laughs> and, and Truth. we, and, 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 uh, so we, Michael, Mikey was a year younger than me and we brought him to school on the first day, you know, 
high school tough we rolled up like it was jack hellerman david <laughs> shyman um me vince. and you and vince yeah so you know we we went to this 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 great this interesting school with lots of lots of talented people you know and and, and um you know it's interesting like i i went there for vocal and to be honest it wasn't I'm, I'm so stupid i auditioned for my drama so my vocal audition i went to the audition and then after the vocal audition i ran to tommy and and chad and some other jerks so instead of like going to my drama audition i went into like smoke weed with them in the meadow so like I, I, I probably would have done better in the school if i went for theater but i went for singing which i still was into but the type of singing we did it was like it was opera. It was fucking lame. I wanted to sing like boys to men and like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so just off the bat, it wasn't something that I really like invested in. So instead I'm like in the bathroom, smoking weed, cutting class, you know, doing graffiti, which something that's that like, I love, you know, and, and, um, you know, it's this, it's this, it's this point in your life where you, where you grow from a, a boy or a, a, a younger like you mature into a man and then you know we 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 haven't we you know kind of had some texts a few weeks ago talking about like the way that we evolved and the way that we grew from these kids you know from these like you know you know all the challenges that we dealt with and then growing into in, into being a man and and like all these challenges and you know like Sean McLean, he, he was one of my best friends. He, he passed away when we were senior year, junior year of, of high school. But like, he was a tough kid. He was an Irish kid. He had a gun when we were 13. I'm like, who has a fucking gun when you're 13? And he, you know, it's like, he had a razor blade on him and all the time. He like, he, he, you know, he, he, he struggled with like depression and lots of things, but, but he was a tough fucking kid. And I remember I was in the hallway and, uh, some guy bumped into me and we like kind of barked at each other and then we went our ways and Sean was like, yo, if you don't fuck him up after school, yo, we got a problem. And then I'd never really gotten into a fight. i like got into little scraps when I was a little kid and kind of got beat up by my brother all the time and got muscled a lot when I, when I was a young kid, you know, like, but that was the first time in my life I ever stood up for myself. And so at the end of school, Sean was like, yo, dude, if you don't fuck him up, you i'm gonna fuck you up i was like damn so after school i was like yo what's up and we walked up to to um uh riverside park and 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 we fought and i like beat the shit out of him and it was the first time in my life i was like wow i could do this you know and i know that like you know mike i love you and you know i, I was i was not the best person to 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 michael Turner when we were kids like and and we've 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 kind of worked through it for over the past 30 years but like, yo, I was on the list of who would get stabbed first. Like if Mikey, if you know, it comes into the school and fucking has a shotgun, I'm at the top of the list. I was a fucking asshole. And, and you know, and, and you posted something a few weeks ago and I text you, I'm like, yo, I'm sorry. I'm a fucking asshole. You know, and it's this vicious cycle. Like people that I love bullied me. And I was, my, I was that guy. And, 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 you know, like, I'm, you know, I love you and I appreciate you and I apologize for, for being this fucking shitty kid. And like, you don't know what people are dealing with. Like no one knew that my mom was an alcoholic and a drug addict or my brother had these issues or I never saw my dad. Like you don't understand the fucking shit that people deal with. Um, you know, but it's, it's something that like, I don't know, it's something that I teach my kids. Like my son, I'm like, yo, you have to stand up for people. You need to not let anyone fucking push you around. Like if someone is being a bully, you fucking, you, you protect that person, you know? So it's like, you, you know, know something though, man, I, I want to, I want to say, and, and, and I said it in the text. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, you know, the, those years I remember freshmen. I mean, I, I, I also remember that first day of school. Right. And I remember uh, all you guys, we were walking down, uh, we were walking on 66th street. I was 13. And Vince was like walking next to me. He was like, look, dude, you just gotta like, you gotta be a man now. Now it's about being a man. <laughs> and he was like, you just gotta be prepared. You know, like there's just gonna be people that are gonna step in your way and you just gotta, you know. And I'm, I'm like listening to this and I remember feeling like, 
like, like, you know, I went to Wagner junior high too, which is a really rough junior high, dude. I mean, it was, it was, yeah. it was a really, really rough junior high. And uh, I got my ass kicked a few times, but I got into a number of fights there, not willingly, you know what I mean? It was just yeah. <laughs> like, you know, some dude is going to walk up to you and, and grab your hat. And if you didn't do anything about it, yeah, it's a you're problem. a mark, you know? And so I remember like with you specifically, like, I was a small kid and, and you like, I think in the beginning you were really just fucking with me. And I think what pushed you to continue to fuck with me as just like the younger kid was that I stood up for myself. And I think that that taught me something, um, invaluable, man. And I say this, look, like there's no doubt, right? Like, like the bully thing is real and yeah. A lot of kids fall victim to it um, and, you know, and that sucks. The lesson I learned through, you know, the first, you know, sophomore and uh, freshman and sophomore year, I think we kind of became cool in my junior year and you were a senior was um, you were the one guy that I was like, yo, dude, th like this guy, if he's, he's going to fuck with me and I'm going to fucking, I'm going to stand up for myself and I'm not going to like, I'm not going to back down. And that taught me invaluable lessons, man. It really did, dude. And I know it, like it, it's in it's in a roundabout way, but I'm grateful for it. And uh, and I and I say that in honesty, like it would have been awesome if we were just fucking friends in the beginning and you weren't a fucking <laughs> cocksucker. <laughs> but you know, like that's that's the truth, right? Like I was one of those guys that was a that was always like a smaller dude, but I. Um, I stood my ground in most cases. And I think that that is ultimately what I do today. You know, like, yeah, I think, you know, it's the same thing. Like Sean, Sean was like, you know, people have, and, and Hey, trust me, man. I'm like, I'm like not proud of, of, the, of, of that, but like, yeah, we evolved. We're like, dude, I was a 13 year old, 14 year old kid, like dealing with my own struggles. Like, you, like you don't realize. And that's why, like, I had no one giving me guidance, like be a good fucking person, you know, like, and and for some somehow in in my life now I've managed, I've like, you know, in spite everything in my life and all this, all the struggles, it's one thing I'm very proud of, is like the most important thing for me is people, and I care about people, and I and like, above and beyond anything else, you know, and like, and I'm, and you're like instilling that in in Gavin and Avery. I'm like, yo, be good people. It's the most important thing. Nothing else matters, you know. Um, yeah, man. You know, it was. New York City in the 90s, it was tough. It was the murder capital of the world, of, of, of the US. You know, it was like not a safe place, but I didn't even, I didn't, I was never really afraid. I don't think we were afraid. We were running the streets all night, for, you know, like doing dumb shit. You know, we, we, uh, but it made, it made us who we are. You know, like we are the sum of those experiences. 100%. For better or for worse, you know, and like those things made us who we are here, gave you the drive to like conquer these fears, get sober, get fucking ripped and jacked and focus and open businesses. And you know what I'm saying? Like all those things, like for bad or for worse, all the great things and all the, the amazing people that are, that, that were in my life or, and are still in my life and all the shit, all the terrible moments, they made us who we are, you know? So, you know, you look, I look back at my experiences and I'm thankful for them all. You know, because one, if one's different, I'm a different person, you know, so, um, you know, it's something that I wanted to talk about here because, you know, we've been friends for, for forever, you know, and like, you know, a year or two, we were, I was a dickhead and then, and then I'm like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> like, you know, and, 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 the, you know, the evolution of us, I, I think has been very cool. And to like, you know, it's interesting that um, when I did the Boku store, uh, there was a Florence Fabricant, like, you know, like. The, Can you tell uh, us what the Boku store is real quick? Yeah. So the Boku store, Paul Bocuse is, um, he's the godfather of French cuisine. He just passed away. He was like in his early nineties, uh, maybe two years ago. Um, and every great French chef worked for him. John George worked for him. Daniel Blude worked for him. Um, you know, uh, Elaine Ducasse worked for him, like all the, like God, all, all the people that we look up to were his protégés. Um, and he created this competition where 
there are 24 countries in the world and you have a chef from each country and you compete to see who is the best chef. And I was lucky enough to um, compete in 2011 and um, it was amazing. It changed my life. I was a sous chef at 11 Madison Park, which was a really good restaurant then. Um, and I did this competition. I won in the US and I beat, it was 12 chefs and I, and I beat them. And then for that year I trained, I lived at the French Laundry for like six weeks in Thomas's, uh, Thomas Keller's father's home, which was like on the compound. We went to Lyon, we went to Zurich. We like, you know, every amazing chef I had as, as a resource. You know, I'm like reaching out to Grant Ackett. So I'm like, Grant, teach me this or, or these guys. And we went to the White House and cooked for, cooked for Michelle Obama. You know, it was like, it changed, you know, that moment changed who I am. And um, was that, was that, was that a moment in your life that changed? Yeah, Evan? dramatically, because Gavin was born. And I was, and I was the, a sous chef at, at this great restaurant. You know, we hadn't even got a Michelin star. We, we were just a really good restaurant. We were, we were like, the goal was to be this great restaurant and we were building. And um, Gavin was born and I'm like, I just need to do more. I need to like, how do I differentiate myself from everyone else? Cause I'm in the kitchen with lots of great people that have been cooking for a long time. Like how, how, how do I differentiate myself? And why, why did, why did you want to do that though? That, that, that's the question. Like why, what, what, why did, why did you feel the need to distinguish yourself? What was the, yeah. can you fucking put a finger on that? I, 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 I definitely can. And I feel like for me, it was about my children. I'm like, I have a child. How do I, how do I give this kid a better life? And it wasn't about me having an ego. It wasn't about winning. You know, like for me, it's not, not about winning. It's not a, it's about, it's not about the end result. It's about, it's about the ride. You know, like, I don't, not that I don't care about these accolades, a mission star, 50 best, three mission stars, like those things are incredible, but they are a byproduct of, 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 of the experience and an amazing product. And for me, I told myself this, I'm like, dude, I need fucking more for these kids. Like we were living in a studio in Brooklyn Heights. It was me, Kelly, Gavin, and a dog in a studio. And then we had Avery. We had another kid. <laughs> we like, and we were living in this little, little place. And I'm like, how do I, and it's interesting. I've had, I've had cooks that had kids and say, I think I want to like, I think I want to do less. I think I'm going to like, I want to be a photographer so I could, uh, so I could spend more time with my kids. And I'm like, you know, that's noble and that's amazing. And if you have the means to do that, I think that's fine. I'm for me, like, I didn't have the luxury to do that, you know? And I knew the first five years i'm the one that's missing those times they're not necessarily missing me because they're little kids they don't really realize who's around you know like they may you know i know that that you know i i was definitely as present as i could be but i, I was willing to trade that in to invest in myself if it was later on in life like now my goal is to invest more time in, into my family but at that moment it was a calculated thought process to invest in my career so that it pays dividends later on. So that literally, I'm like, I need to be more. I need to dig deeper, you know, and, and, and it paid off. And, you know, and I did this competition, the Boku store, and the story was, so the day Florence Fabricant was like, James Kent won the Boku store USA. You guys, you and Daniel had your photograph. You got the lead. I was fucking pissed. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, had, you had your photo. Gotcha. You, had, you got, gotcha. you got, <laughs> Got him. Yo, so, so, yo, you, you and Daniel Holtzman, who's your partner and also um, uh, someone we went to school with. Um, we were in the same times. It was amazing. It was, it was like a moment in time and I was super proud of you. And, and we did a Boku story like documentary and, and um, you know, we filmed it at the meatball shop and I was, you know, it was like a proud moment. Like someone, cause trust me, I had been with you at six in the morning on house and street in the hotel with, with your dog, where, you know, where, where we were just asked to fuck out. Like I'd been there, we'd been there together. And now we're together in this high, this amazing moment. You know, it was such, I was super proud. Um, and like, it, it's interesting. I, I go back to like interviews that I had back then. It's like, what's your favorite restaurant? I was like, meatball shop. It's like, what's the best place to party? I'm like, meatball shop. I remember I, I have a little booklet for something that I did. And, and I shouted you out. Uh, several times um 
you know, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. Like you don't realize how small New York is, you know, the kids that you had beef with on the Upper East Side or the kids from the Upper West Side or the kids from Brooklyn, like eventually you're all boys and you're all on the same path. And people come in and out of, of, of your life. You don't I, like, I'm just coming to terms with that. You know, like as a little kid, you thought you were in your own, like, kind of select group but people come in and out you know over over the length of this life that we live here in new york hmm. you know it's it's like a small it's a small circle um what was the what was the moment for you i mean do you can you recall the moment where you said cooking was going to be your thing you're not like i just want to also make everybody aware of the fact that like jamal is like people are going to be talking about jamal He's, he's in the beginning of his career, honestly, right? Like he, he's got at least another 20 years of doing what he's doing. And he's like one of the most celebrated chefs in New York City, which is the most celebrated city in the world for food, uh, which makes him one of the most celebrated chefs oh, in the world. It. So like, like, you know, you what what was it? Was there a moment where you were like, all right, this is so, it? There were several, several times. So, you know, the one thing that we did have when I was young is, is my, my grandma being the, the matriarch and like having um, rituals that are really important. She would have dinners and we would go to her house and we'd eat like a lamb and, and whatever it was. And Thanksgiving would always be this, this amazing thing. So for me, there's not one point, but there's, there's like a string like food for me meant nurturing you know meant bringing people together meant special moments so at a young age I, I thought it was really interesting and something that I wanted to contribute so I would like you know make a cheesecake or like make the vinaigrette or make us you know something at a really really young age you know and then you know I fell into this restaurant in Hell's Kitchen and I did and I liked it and it was a job and then Boulay moved into my building when we were kids David Boulay, uh, you know, like that restaurant was the, probably the best restaurant in the U.S. You know, he worked for Paul Bocuse. Yo, he taught Jerome Bocuse English, <laughs> which is Paul Bocuse's son. So Jerome is a really good friend of mine. And Jerome, part of his mise en place was before service, he would go read um, English like, like Dr. Seuss books to Paul Bocuse's son in like the garden yeah. <laughs> before service. You know, so, so you know, Boulay moved into my building and, and, and my mother, and we, we ate there and it was incredible. Um, and my mother made me go knock on the door and I ended up not knocking there. I like wrote a note and like, cause I was a shy little kid and this was a badass chef. And I like wrote notes, like I'm upstairs. I want to work there. I work for free. So I slipped it under his door. And after freshman year of high school, I spent the summer with Boulay. Um, and I worked one day a week cause I also had my other job. And then I went to summer school cause I was an idiot. I went to summer school every year. I, Mike, you were probably in there with the, everyone went to summer school because we never went to class. I don't think any. I mean, anybody that we knew went to summer school. <laughs> every year. I never had a summer off. It's fucking yeah. ridiculous. Just go to the school. Yo, kids, go to school and have the summer off. It makes way more sense. By the but way, again, like, I found my fucking senior year uh, report card. Oh, magic. Amazing. <laughs> Dude, 100, 165 class cuts. Yeah I, yeah, I had something my sophomore year was that year. Sophomore year was like, yo, the only class I passed was the one that Kelly was in, the <laughs> science class. So I would like go and fuck with her. And like, oh was my God. One. But every Crazy. class I failed. Um, so I, I, I worked at Boulay on Sunday. I worked at the restaurant where I got paid on Saturday. And then I went to summer school. So I spent, I spent a summer there. And, you know, it's interesting. My mother moved out of our childhood home and she found the matchbook from Boulay and she framed it and gave it to me for my birthday or Christmas. And it was, it was Boulay's name and I crossed it out and wrote Jamal's. <laughs> and then on the other side, I did the same thing. I wrote my name on it. So like at that point, I'm not sure how old that we went there twice. I went there when I was like 15 or 16, like 13, 14, 15, somewhere around there. I, like, I was like, yo, this is what I want to do. And when I was at the Nomad, I had it up in the office that showed where I started, you know, and then Another kind of kind of magical moment is I went to Johnson and Wales University in Providence. It's a culinary school. I didn't even know it was a culinary school. My girlfriend at the time gave me an application and it was like no, no essay, no SATs. 
and you just have to apply. And I got in not knowing that it was a culinary school. So I, I, I go there and the reason why they, they let me in is because I have this like restaurant experience, but I went there for business. So I was in this, this culinary school in Providence, learning about marketing, like the life cycle of a Pepsi product, which is fucking stupid. And I'm like, yo, it's for some reason, I'm meant to be here. So I, I essentially, after I got an associates in marketing, I, I, I switched to the culinary campus and, and got a culinary degree. So it was like, you know, all these, all these moments that are just kind of not meant to happen, you know, it's just, or, or meant to happen. Like, you know, just, you know, kind of, um, you know, I was at this culinary school and I'm like, wow, this is what I want to do. This is, this is, I've like, I've cooked my, I've worked in restaurants since I was 12. I started at the Re Pietro Santa in Hell's Kitchen at 12. From 12 and I'm 20, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like learning about this bullshit. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. You know, so, so like this cooking found me, you know, these, those like few moments, the, the seeds, the trail that brought me to where I'm here, you know? And uh, yeah, it's interesting. So you went, uh, you, you ended up working for Jean George and then you spent some time in the kitchen there. And I remember you telling me all sorts of cool shit that you guys were doing. And that was like, um, and, and I was, I was working in restaurants, but nothing, nothing like that. Yeah, you, I was, you were at Frank, at Frankie's. I was at Frank, right. Um, and, and so, you know, and you did something different too, which is, which is pretty unique, right? Like most chefs today when you ask them you know where they've worked it's like oh I did a year here 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 like nobody gets nobody makes like sue it's rare right like it's like yeah you yeah. do like a couple years and then or a year and you learn and then you kind of you hop to the next spot to learn and um but you ended up you did like bids at these places um you did yeah. you spent time um, especially for chef Daniel Hum, where you yeah. spent a long time. Do, do you, was there a reason why you, you chose to spend 10 years there? I, th I think it, it was all really like organic, very like all these restaurants. It was, you know, every restaurant I went into, my goal was just to learn and evolve and, and my path and end it, you know, I'm like, okay, there's no more room, you know, there's no, and the, and, the restaurant industry, and I use this analogy all the time, it's not like Toyota, where you work for Toyota for 45 years, then they have a gold Rolex on your 45th year of work and you retire. Um, you know, the restaurant industry is about gaining knowledge. And, you know, you can't learn how to cook from one person because there's skills that he, that he or she just, they don't have. So as a cook, you have to evolve, you have to grow, you have to learn from different people. But for me, I, I always saw the, 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 my shortest tenure I, was a two-year tenure. So at the end of two years, I'm like, wow, I did, I did a lot. I've learned a lot. I don't see any more. And at 11 Madison Park, you know, I, I walked into 11 Madison Park and it was amazing. So my grandfather's song, when I walked into EMP, there was a Charles Mingus song playing in the dining room. So I walked in Goodbye Pork Pie Hat, which is like Charles is like most, one of his most famous songs. And I was, I was a good cook, you know, I worked at great restaurants, but whenever you go into stage at a restaurant, it's fucking intimidating. You know, it's someone else's energy. You walk in and you're nervous, but even a seasoned cook who'd been cooking for a long time and listening to that song kind of, I was like, wow, this, this feels like my home literally from day one. It, this shit was crazy. Um, but so going into Love Madison Park, I was like, I'm just going to be there a year. I'm like, I'm going to become a sous chef. Then I'm going to go open a restaurant, whatever it was. Like my, my, my thought process was that it would be a really short tenure. And, you know, I remember Daniel, you know, he was running the kitchen. He was on the pass. It was his food. And I'd always worked for the chef that worked for the chef at every previous restaurant. And when we, when he interviewed me, he was like, we're going to get four stars. He's like, yeah, I promise you, this is what we're doing. I'm like, wow, this guy's fucking amazing. And I, I'd never had someone like that. Daniel, I love, he's my brother. We've, we've, we've grown together and built this amazing restaurant, but I'd never had someone that inspirational in my life. No one ever was like, dude, you can do anything. And this is what I tell my kids. I'm like, yo, anything you want to do, 
yo, you work hard and you care about what you're doing, you can fucking succeed. I never had that. I, it, like I found my way. I randomly found a good a job that fell into a career, but there wasn't someone like inspiring me to do that until I met Daniel. And, and he was like, yo, we're doing this. And I'm like, we're not attempting to do it. We are fucking doing it. Um, and the food was incredible. The energy was like intense. And, um, you know, they had a job for a sous chef and they had a job for a line cook. And for me, I'd never been a sous chef. I could have been like, I had the skill level, but like when you hire someone at that level, it, it, it oftentimes doesn't work because you walk in and you have a bullseye on you. So I literally, I'm like, I want to cook. I started as the meat roast and I literally was the meat roast for two weeks. And he's like, you're the next sous chef. And there was one point it was crazy. I like detailed my fridge and cleaned it and made it perfect because it was like someone else's before I came. I took it apart at the end of the night. I stayed an extra hour, scrubbed it, made it perfect. I'm like, okay, now I can work. And the next day, Daniel's going through the line, tasting food. He opened my drawer. He was like, yo, everyone come here. Stop the whole kitchen to look at my shit because it was just perfect. He's like, yo, this is how everyone needs to fucking be. You know, it was a moment that I was like, was super, I was very proud of that. And I wasn't intending for anyone to see that. You know, it's like when no one's looking kind of thing, like, um, um, you know, this like excellence reflex, like you don't do it for anyone else other than yourself. Like it's a habit. It's something that, that like, it doesn't work. You know, it's, it's not this external pressure. It's this internal pressure. You do it for yourself. And, and at that moment mm -hmm. I was like validated. It was, it felt really good. Cause I, I, I didn't expect anything. I, it's just how it worked. Cause I learned it from someone previously that, that like drilled me said, this is how it is perfect perfection clean organized you know and that moment you know i was like wow this is you know it, 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 it was a, it was a proud moment where this badass chef was like this is the guy that is such a fucking pro profound experience that you had i love that you said excellent ref the excellence reflex i mean yeah. that you know i also think anybody listening right like there if you're doing it for others all the time chances are you're not going to be putting up your best work no, right no. the 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 effect that one has on themselves i think is more powerful than the effect that one has on others and we are our worst critics and so 100%. if you can reframe or sort of reprioritize and i say this shit this is the, this is something that i get a little flack for right um I, in my life, currently, I do put myself first. I do over my family and my kids and not, not, not saying that I sacrifice time with my family and my kids, but I know that the work that I do on myself is ultimately going to impact the work that I'm able to provide or the, the, the effect that I'm going to have on others. And so I love that idea, that analogy where you just literally, you took apart your fridge and you set it up so that you felt like you could work there. Um, that's awesome, dude. Yes. Yeah, so, hey, and it's also, so we like, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the way that restaurants had been run forever was always this fear. It was the fear of the chef finding you and torturing you and embarrassing you. And, and for me, you know, like I've, I've, I've yelled seven times in, you know, in my 20 year career in, in the kitchen, you know, like I've thrown one plate in, in 20 years. What you was know, that so experience? Like, oh, it, was a piece of that. it was a piece of foie gras. So we, <laughs> we, um, at EMP, we had a sous chef that ran the line and there was a fish sous chef and a meat sous chef. And there was seared foie gras that was on the fish line, but we had to move it because it just didn't work. It was a log jam. It was an earlier course. So we put it on the meat side where there, there was an extra cook. Um, and the sous chef, I was like, hey, we're going we're gonna to put it on your line. He was fucking pissed. And he was just like, like grumbling and miserable. And so he never taught his cook how to cook it. You know, he just didn't, he wanted nothing to do with it. And so the first order came in. I'm like, fire, fire foie gras. So he, you know, he like the sous chef boycotted. He was just like, and, and I'm not going to embarrass him or, or shit on him. I'm not that person. 
I'm just going to like, you know, if it goes back to like the Danny Meyer thing where you put the salt shaker in, in, the, in the center of the table, which is his job is to put it in the center of the table. Your job or my cook's job is to do it a little bit differently and I slowly push it back in the center. You know, and at this point, one piece, it was overcooked and I'm like, do it again. I didn't yell. I wasn't miserable. I wasn't like, yeah, you fucking idiot, do it again. And I'm like, he did it again, fucked it up again. I'm like, do it again. And like, instead of the sous chef showing him how to do it and, and like teaching him, he was letting him sink. And he, and he did it a third time. And then I got fucking furious because it's not, I'm like, yo, this is something that I decided. I'm the chef de cuisine. I'm running this restaurant. It's for the better good of the whole restaurant. You need to support me. And, and, um, you know, and I picked, I literally like do it and smash it against the wall. And I fucking screamed on him. I'm like, yo, teach him how to cook it. This is what it is. This is what we need to need to do for the better of the restaurant. And that was, that was the one time, like, I, you know, like, I don't run a restaurant like that. And I've worked in restaurants like that. Like, okay, I did that once, but to like live every day on like pins and needles that if you make a mistake, you're going to get tortured. You know, you are going to make a mistake because all you're thinking about is not making a mistake. So you're going to fuck it up. If, if I just inspire you to make great food hmm. because the guest is coming in and they've, you know, love Madison Park, man, it's like a fucking arm and a leg to eat there. And the reservations are months out in advance. Like this person flew in from somewhere around the world or saved all their money and walked to the restaurant. And, you know, like we want to give them the best experience possible. And, you know, and that's how, how like I inspire the team. You know, it's not about me catching them and saying, and, and embarrassing them if they do something wrong i gently i talk them through it and and teach them how to do it and if they do it wrong again i teach them again you know it's, it's when there's an habit or if there's like they're, they're consciously disrespecting the team the food the you know the, the things that we hold dear that's when i get really fucking upset um and uh it's it's a it's a you know it goes back to this thing that i i, I say pretty regularly um there's a huge difference between wanting to win and not wanting to lose, right? Yeah. There's a huge, huge difference in a, yeah, in, a, in the mentality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you, when you lead with an iron fist or you lead through uh, fear, most people that work underneath you uh, are just trying not to lose, man. They're just like, yeah, let me just, let me 100%. just, you know, but when you lead with positivity, optimism, kindness, inspiration, motivation, people are actually walking onto the field ready to fucking win. They just, they, they, they don't, and, and it's not, they want to win for themselves, obviously too, but like they want to win for you, you know, yeah, 100%. and huge difference. Um, I would love you to just take us through like, what is it like, what, like when EMP 11 Madison Park was the best restaurant in the country, was it the best restaurant in the world? The world, yeah. Best the restaurant world. in the world, <laughs> number one yeah. in the world. I don't know how you're trying to play me, dude. Down sorry, all, all, all my success over here. Best yeah. in the world, um, which is fucking insane. You're running the best restaurant in the world. Um, can you just walk us through like a Friday night at seven o'clock? What that felt like? You know, it, it, it's it, it's such a dance. You know, it's like. There was one moment and, and, you know, we don't yell. It's, it's a very busy kitchen. It's bustling. It, it's this, it, it's this like choreographed machine, you know, that works incredibly well. And, and, you know, obviously that's not always the case because we're learning and growing and evolving and there's new people and there's new food and there's always, always challenges. But I think what, what the team at that restaurant, there was, we were all, on the same path and we had all the same goals and you know we used to do these these yearly um strategic planning meetings wait hold on one second let me just draw the blinds because i can't even fucking see yeah. Yeah, yeah Oh, yeah, so much better. Yeah, well, um, yeah. So, so we had these uh, strategic planning meetings that we did annually, and it was a way for us to 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 put 
put language to what was important to us and and to set goals that were that were tangible you know and and it but it started with what were the thing what what the question that we asked ourselves is what would you do if you knew that you couldn't fail so so and and this was to the whole team and and we would have these these like lofty ideas and thoughts and ideas and eventually you'd have like four or five live gems you know so we would put language to it and we would put it on the wall and every year it would change and so having a cohesive like team all pushing towards the same goal was what was was uh, the reason for a lot of our success you know and then on that on that friday night man it was it was it was this like energetic like stressful uh, emotional you know kind of crazy place and and to be honest um it's something that, that i've talked about a lot it's it's so my mental health at 11 madison park was terrible and my and my physical health you know, um, so like for all that hard work, it, it, it took a toll on, on, on my body. Um, and I was walking into the restaurant one day and I, and literally for the, for the month prior, I thought I had like diabetes, my, my, like literally I thought I was dying. Cause I'm just like, I'm a hypochondriac. And I, Daniel went to Pebble beach to do, do, um, a dinner and I had to work like 10 days straight. And on day one, I felt like delirious. I'm like, damn. So I like, I couldn't take a day off because no one else could run the restaurant. So I'm like, I took caffeine away. I took sugar away. I took gluten. I was just like self-diagnosing myself because I'm a fucking psycho. Um, and I would like, I was taking a- aspirin because I thought I, I was just like, I was really freaking myself. And I walked into the restaurant one day and I thought I was dying. Literally, I like fell to the floor. I was a few blocks away. I went to the ER um, and my heart was pounding. I was sweating. I was, and I walked into the ER and they let me go an hour later and Kelly came and, and, and I'm like, yo, how are you letting me go? I fucking feel like shit. So I took every test known to man. I had like the 50 cent, like EKG running on a treadmill. Um, and the doctor was like, you're half stupid. I'm like, well, I knew that, <laughs> um, you know, he, and I was overweight. Uh, you know, I was like not healthy, but he's like, yo, you're stressed out. He's like, you had a panic attack. So I had this panic attack. And it like debilitated me, you know, I'd like couldn't go into CVS because it was just the, the noises would fucking, you know, and so, so I started working on myself, you know, I like, I, I, I got some therapy, I, do, I did sound healing, like meditation and sound healing with, with like Tibetan bowls and breathing exercises. And that's when I started running. Um, and I've ran three marathons since and, it, and I changed my life and I worked on my diet. You know, I, I was like 255 pounds and, and, you know, like me, like when I was running the marathon, I was 204. So I was like 50 pounds overweight. Um, and I just, I, I realized that I need to start giving back to myself. And, and I used this a lot. Like we're, we're, we're um, an ATM. I'm an ATM. You're an ATM. And like, you just invest in yourself and you put money in there. And then eventually you need to start taking some of that shit out, you know? It's so, so I like, you know, it, it was just there. They were non-negotiables. My career was no longer the most important thing because like how you're, you're like, what you're doing for yourself is making everyone in your life and your circle better. What I was doing was everything was worse. I was unhealthy. I was scared. Uh, you know, I was stressed out. You know, I, I couldn't be good for my family. I couldn't be good for my wife. I couldn't be good for the restaurant. You know, if I'm like, you know, not able to really focus and run this, this, you know, three mission star, one of the best restaurants in the world, the best restaurant in the world, you know? So I've realized that, you know, when I was younger, you have to invest, you have to invest in yourself and you can, cause you're young and you can take risks and you can like work as much as you, as you, as you want. And it doesn't really affect you, but there's a certain point where you need to have that balance and you need to give it back to yourself. And giving back to yourself means just sleeping in or going for a run or doing things with your people you love. So at that moment, literally, like, I was like, I'm going to fucking see the people I love more. And I called Chad. I'm like, Chad, I love you. I haven't seen you. I'm like, I'm going to come see you. Like these things that you need to do. And I didn't really realize. I thought I was doing the right thing. I did the Boku store. I worked 100 days straight. 
I ran this crazy restaurant. I was doing everything that anyone asked of me in the restaurant. But like my body was telling me, yo, shit is a, there's a problem, you know? And it took me, it took me a long time to really understand that. And, you know, we started the, the, the make a nice run club. Um, you know, I started running and Daniel was like, I want to support you. He's like, yo, let's go, let's all go running in the park. So we, you know, we ran in the park and then I ran the marathon in 2016, I think 15 or 16. And we ran the, the, the next two. So I ran three. Um, and we ended up growing the team. We had 30 people run the marathon, you know, and it was like, it was this, this crazy thing, you know, and, uh, you need to give back to yourself. And, and I say this, you cannot grow professionally if you're not growing personally, you know, and I see people doing it. I see people that are like at the top, they're the fucking best chefs in the world. And they look at me, they're like, yo, I envy you. Cause you have a wife, you have kids that you love, you know, like, like for me, it's not just about getting three million stars or having the best restaurant or like making the most money, you know, it's about balance. It's about giving back to, to the people that I love, you know? And, and, you know, like, man, like you inspired me seeing you like the, your evolution over the past 10 years or whatever, whenever it started from like, you know, turning into who you are, who's like the fittest man that I know, <laughs> you know, like, I think, um, you know, it's something that, you know, I, I look towards people. Yeah, and uh, you know, for like guidance. And even if I didn't reach out to you, I look at it and like, wow, what he's doing is smart and right. You Dude, I, I I think that 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 what you say is the message that I've been trying to put out there for some time. And um, you know, successful people um, lead busy lives, right? Like it's just it, there's no way to be successful yeah, unless you are busy person however <laughs> there's no point in being successful quote unquote if you're dying or if the people around you can't stand to be around you because a either you're just not available like physically or even when you're there you're you're mentally checked out um, and that's why earlier i said you know I put myself first and, and that means that I do wake up at fucking five o'clock in the morning and I have about two and a half hours to focus on my wellness. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm so stoked when I, when I started to see you out there running, it inspired me, dude. I was like, wow, man, this guy's going for it. I mean, like I was watching on social media and you were, you were out there doing it. And I, and I say like, if the, if the man running the busiest, best restaurant in the world, literally the boss of the best restaurant in the world can, can put the time aside to take care of himself, anyone can do it. The restaurant business is the toughest business. I'm not just saying that because you and I are in it and have been in it for our whole lives. I'm saying that because it's a fucking fact. It is, it is you know, for a, I always say it like this. A $60 transaction in one of my restaurants takes about 19 people to pull off. A $60 transaction at like the gap takes one person to pull off. A, a $500 transaction at one of your restaurants takes about 70 fucking people to pull off. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it so hard because it's not only a, an absolute like execution game, but the people are the most important component of it. And at any given time, I've sort of calibrated this when I was, you know, when I was running Meatball Shop in Seymour's, that at any given time, out of the 350 people that were working at one of those two different restaurant groups, 15% of them don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. And also, are not there. So like literally not there, just like don't show up. And you have, and, 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 and actually like have a job to do. And when they don't show up, <laughs> you're, you're in yeah, big you're fucking trouble. You're like in big trouble. Right. And so it's just a really tough business, man. So I think the message here is you, any, everyone and anyone should be investing in themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I've seen the change in you, man. 
even coming to eat at your restaurant before the pandemic, you know, whatever it was a year and eight months ago, and just your attitude in there and your, um, the calmness that you had and the place was packed to the gills and it's a newer restaurant. And just the way you were in the kitchen with your staff, just like, I just was watching you. And I was like, dude, this guy is like, he's legendary. Well, I, I mean, it, man. it's I true. It, love, dude. Yeah. And, um, and I'm, and that's, so say, yeah. No, we, we, you know, we, we've like, so we've done a lot of work over the past year and a half, you know, like we've, you know, we, this restaurant is massive and it is a cruise ship, you know, so to make any real changes, you know, it's like, how do you turn a fucking cruise ship? You know, it's impossible. So this past year, you know, we all were forced to stop and, and, and like internalize and, you know, initially there was lots of fear and, and, you know, there was fear for our health, there was fear for our business, there was fear for the people that we love, was, you know, all these kind of crazy fucking feelings and emotions, you know, and then, you know, as it slowly got back to normal for us in the restaurant, we realized that we, we could evolve and grow, that there are things that we didn't necessarily do the right way. And all the things that I may say, and I'm a good person, and, and, and the way that I treat people may not necessarily translate to the, the newest uh, um, porter or cook. So we've, over the past year, past year and a half, we've really tried to change our restaurant and, you know, kind of give back to our teams. Um, you know, give, you know, we're not Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer has the infrastructure where he can teach. And he has, you know, the back office that has, you know, like lots of support. We are not that. We like we we opened a restaurant, and thankfully on day one we caught fire and we were running. Um, but we were oftentimes shooting from the hip, and just like throwing bodies at things and not like not solving problems, and, but just like putting band aids on them. You know, so so we we were able to internalize a lot. And this past year, you know, we realized that. You know, you, your staff is the most important thing, our staff. And we want to make sure that we support them and in, in lots of different ways. And so our management team, you know, we used to work 80 hours a week. And I would have the guys come in, or girls, I would have the sous chef team come in. They would work on R&D on a few days a week at 8 in the morning. Let's say they came in at 9 o'clock. We had a tasting at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And then we went into service. And we would work till one or two in the morning and just compounded over days and weeks. It turned into like we had zombies and, and the team would like, instead of nurturing and, and guiding the team, they would flip out or, you know, so we understood that, that the, that the system was broken. So we, our management team works uh, 52 hours a week. Um, whereas they worked 80 hours a week and we pay them the same. So essentially we, we found a way we to pay them the same, but they work less. And now, yeah, you know, we have the the, the um, you know the efficiency, the amount, of the the work that they do get done in that shorter period of time. Although it's probably not as much as the eighty-hour work week, it's better, and the culture is better, and people are happier. And I'm like, yo, uh, you know, we give people a night off. One of your days, you you work in the AM and you leave at five, whatever it is. I'm like, yo, go get dinner, go with your loved one, go have a beer, enjoy your life. You know, so we're trying to give back. And whereas, you know, love Madison Park, I worked, I shit you not, <laughs> the chef would schedule me when I was like a young sous chef. He would give me Sunday off. And then 13 days later, the other Sunday, he's like, yo, we're all working six day weeks. I'm like, dog, that's not a six day week. It's a fucking 12 day week, bro. I'm like, what are you doing? Just give me a day in the middle. And now it's like, yo, I literally was not at my best. I was at my worst, you know? And, and for me, it's like, I want my team to, to be successful. I don't want to like give them, you know, uh, um, you know, not give them the tools or allow them to, to succeed. And so it's translating to, to like a, you know, better work environment. And, and, and I was always really proud of the kitchen that we worked in. It was diverse. There were people everywhere. There was women, there were, 
you know, people of color, there was like in all different levels, like, yeah, we, I felt really good about our team, but realistically there were things that I didn't see because I'm the boss. Everyone fucking, you know, like comes to me and says, chef, everything is great. But meanwhile, there's all these things that they can't tell me. Um, and so we, we, we definitely grew over this past year, you know, and we were forced to, we sit, sat idle for, for three, four months until we started cooking again. So we're like, okay, what do we do? How do we get better? How do we evolve? How do we give back to our team? How, you know, we've, we've, we, you know, we, we do uh, the open book management. So we teach the team about our P and L so to learn about the business. We have like management classes that we do monthly with our teams, you know, our HR, um, is incredible and, and has, has been giving the team lots of tools just to grow and evolve. And it may not sound like a big deal, you know, but like for me, this restaurant that we just, you know, kind of <laughs> like concocted together and, and like let run where there was not a lot of structure. Now we're trying to give structure to our teams, give, give support and, um, you know, try to change the way that we, we run the restaurant. I want to finish up by talking about Saga um, and I want to hear about Saga because I can't wait to eat there. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So Saga. Um, so we are in the financial district and we are in uh, a beautiful old art deco building. Building 70 Pani was the AIG office building. So it was built in the thirties. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's one of these iconic New York city, rest, New York city buildings. Um, so on the ground floor, crown shy, you know, it's 120 seats, big, bustling, bumping, good music, biggie photo on the wall. Like, you know, it's, it, it's a fun place. And then Saga is on the 63rd floor. It's from 62 to 66. Uh, so it's the whole crown of the building. And, and, and go online and check the building out. It's beautiful. And the top, it's like the Chrysler building. It kind of wedding cakes back or the Empire State Building. So as it recesses, it creates this terrace. So on, on each floor, we have an outdoor space. And you know, I'm, I'm from New York and I've been here my whole life. And when I walked out on that terrace four years ago, I was like, motherfucker. Like I had never seen the city like this. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. I'm like, yo, I get to open a restaurant here. <laughs> like, I'm like, what? I'm like, this is, this is bananas. Um, and you know, so the restaurant uh, up top, it's a 50 seat restaurant. Um, there's, there's an events floor. There's a fine dining floor. There's a bar. There's lots of cool things, but Saga, the restaurant, you know, it, it's, it's more of a, of a, it's more luxurious experience. It's more, there's more of a, of a narrative, like downstairs at Crown, it's just delicious food. It's simple. It's thoughtful, but you know, we're not trying to challenge people. We're just, we just want to have a lot of fun and eat, eat and cook delicious food. Um, and upstairs, you know, I'm, I'm really digging deeper into my, like my father's heritage. So I, on paper, I'm James Kent, Chef James Kent. Mikey, you know me as Jamal. So my name is Jamal James Kent. And, and my father grew up in North Africa and he's, he's Muslim um, and he's, he's practicing. He's prayed, you know, five times a day for the past 35 years of his life or 40 of my life, whatever, 40 years of my life. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I'm trying to like tell some stories from my childhood. And there's, there, you know, I'm digging deep in this like Moroccan, some some like some elements from his childhood we're doing a, a tea service which is this moroccan tea where you you aerate it and you pour it and you re-steep it and 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 it's this green tea with different mints and it's basically anytime you go to my dad's house he makes you this tea it's it's how he, you're welcome into his home and it's something that is really like important to me and and so the food up there it's more of 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 an expression of of who i am and I think downstairs is also an expression, but th these are more curated moments and more, more kind of thoughtful moments. And, you know, like the idea is like, the goal was never to get a Michelin star at Crown Shot. And, and for me, if someone says, we're opening a three-star Michelin upstairs, I'm like, we're fucking not. I don't care about that shit. The, the, all the awards are, are, are secondary. All the things like at Crown Shot, we opened a dope restaurant Someone thought we, that, that, we, that we earned a star, they gave us a star. But it wasn't like, dude, we're getting a fucking star here. I'm like, we're just going to make a dope restaurant. And Saga, too, it's the same thing. Like, the bones of the restaurant are incredibly special. Like, it, it, you can't make it again. No one is ever going to build that space ever again. It's this, like, this, this place 
that we have the we're, we're, we're the steward of, of, of this beautiful space. And it's going to be here long after after I'm gone and someone else is going to come and be the, be the shepherd of it. So it's like, you know, we're, we're creating something really special. And, you know, the idea was always like, what is the future of fine dining look in New York City? And what is like our generation of guests? Because, you know, like when we were kids, the older the older generation that went to these fancy restaurants, like those aren't necessarily people that are going to come to our restaurants because they're may not be here. <laughs> They've, they've moved on, they've evolved, but like you and I, and the people in our kind of age group that like grew up with the same music and culture, like those are the people I want to create a restaurant for them or for us, you know, at this high level. Like, I'm not trying to bring, ha have your, your grandfather come in or my grandfather, or, you know, it's like they can come and, and if they appreciate listening to hip hop on the 63rd floor in a fine dining restaurant, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like, but we're not catering it. We're like, we're building this type of restaurant for us and and what we think is really cool and special and you know you know I, like and i'm super excited you know and it's what like what's the future of fine dining in new york city is the question we ask and you know we feel like it's a little cooler a little more casual but still like impeccable service delicious food I, you know I, I like the idea of like restraint and restraint is something that it, it and that it takes time to really learn and appreciate because when you're young you're like i got all these techniques and skills i want to show everything put extra this this 10 different things whereas like to 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 like you know put two or three things on a plate like it takes balls you know it's like it, so we're we're attempting to have a bit more restraint um upstairs than you know what historically would have been considered a fine dining experience. Um, and yo, and Jeff Katz, yeah, he, he's uh, my dining room partner here. He's, yo, he's, he's incredible. And, and like the dining room needs to feel fun. It needs to feel like, you know, like you come and there's like music is part of the experience. It's not like this sterile place. And I've been to restaurants in Scandinavia or these French restaurants where it's like pin drop. I'm like, that shit's not fun. I'm like, that's a sensory. That's, that's like, yo, give me that shit. I want to smell food. I want to hear things. I want to taste things like that's the experience. And that's, that's what we're, we're, we're planning on doing or attempting. We're attempting to do all that shit, Mikey. I can't fucking wait, dude. I really can't. Um, yeah, it's crazy, man. I really can't wait. This is an amazing conversation, man. There are so much that uh, we talked about, um, you know, spanning from parenthood to our childhood to our early relationships to where we're at now and um you know the restaurant business and leadership and value and uh, i mean so much uh, i think this is an incredibly valuable episode probably one of my favorites um well hey i appreciate it man you know i appreciate the love and you know uh, i look forward to seeing what you have you know up your sleeves over the next couple of years because i know you, you you got long sleeves and you got stuff in them <laughs> I always finish with uh, with one question, and uh, and and it's and it's the the question of the podcast. Uh, Jamal, do you think you were born or made? You know, I think, and it's funny I asked Jeff uh, before this just to kind of to think it through, and and I think, you know, you know, like the way that you put it, that there's this gene of drive. I, like, I to be honest, I hadn't even really really considered it, but for any of us to make it this far in life, like, dude, we're on this planet. We came from one person millions of years ago, whatever the, whatever the science is, like we have to be fighters to fucking get here. And it has to be ingrained, you know, like, like there's no other way really. But I think for me, like just looking at my story and my path, I feel I was, I was made. I slowly learned and evolved and grew and, 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 you know, and for me, I think it, I think it, it's more of, 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 an, of, an, of an impact, you know, all the things that have made me who I am, like I am the sum of my experiences, you know, and to say that there's not this like, this drive that we all have, I think is, is not fair to say. But I think for me, like, you know, I'm who I am because of Sean making me fight this kid. And after that, I was like, oh, shit, I'm like, I can do it. I, I don't need to get pushed around. And I can, I can, you know, it's like all these things, Daniel, Hum, I walk into EMP 
Daniel's like, we're going to get four fucking stars. And you know what? Like, we can do it. You can do it. And we're going to figure it out. And, you know, it's like those moments in my life have gotten me to this point, you know? And um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of my, my calculus, my kind of thought process of like, you know, of, of, of that, of that question. I love you, man. I love this conversation. Yeah. Likewise, bro. We've known each other for a really long time, dude. And it's, you know, it's so cool to be able to get on a, on a podcast like this, where there's a fair amount of people that, that listen in. And, uh, I get to, I get to really tell stories because ultimately at the end of the day, the human condition desires story right like yeah. it's it, like yeah, the, yeah, the, i asked you what your business you know what to talk about saga and you're telling a story with it you know like that's ultimately what you're doing and and great yeah. entrepreneurs are really good storytellers i appreciate you man i do yeah i appreciate you too, bro and um give your wife a hug for me i haven't seen I her will, in forever man. and i, I can't wait to come eat um have a great fucking rest of your day dude you're a legend yeah word likewise peace bro thanks Holmes. yeah peace